Well, this is the Journey Till Podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Zanotti. I believe life is about the journey, not the destination, to find the journey in every step of the road, the highs and lows, the twists and turns, the ups and downs. It's in that, it's in those moments that really makes life so beautiful. Our guest today has a journey of his own. Dr. Ian Smith is a physician. He's an author. He's a TV host. He's best known for hosting the show, The Doctors. Please help me welcome Dr. Ian Smith to the show. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be with you. I am so glad to have you here. I want to first start off with really talking about COVID. What has COVID been like for you? What has this time period been like for you, um, knowing your background and your history and what all is going on in the world? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, a year and a half ago, when COVID really started, a little more than a year and a half ago, uh, I was very clear on Instagram and Twitter, please take this coronavirus seriously. Explain to people that I thought that we were going to be in for a long haul. Uh, and the reason why I thought we were going to be in for a long haul is because, number one, it was a novel virus that we had never seen before. So doctors and scientists needed to play catch up. But also because any second year medical student knows about virology, which is the study of viruses. And they understand how viruses replicate and how they are transmitted and how they can be defeated. And so any medical student finishing their second year would have known that in order for us to really defeat COVID effectively and quickly, we would all have to take measures and, and do things in a preventive and in a, an interventional way together. Uh, you cannot beat a virus by one part of the country doing one thing, another part doing something else and everything in between. And so I knew we'd be in for the long haul. Unfortunately, it's not what I wanted, but I think there were signs that we were not going to be cohesive in our fight against this deadly virus. So I said from the beginning that people need to be worried about things that they can control. Uh, uh, and there are certain things you won't be able to control and you can't stress out about it. Do what's in your purview and be productive. And so I was very productive. I wrote a lot. Uh, I wrote two and a half books uh, during COVID. Um, I was able to stay home with my family, which uh, was a blessing because I've been on the road doing tours and making appearances for so many years that it was wonderful to be home in my house with my family around the clock. And so for me, it was an extremely productive period. It, would al it was also a very um, illustrative um, and clarifying period for me personally, um, as I thought about my life and where I've been and where I am, where I want to go. It just gave me a lot of time to think about things and, and, and to appreciate the simplicity of life, things that we all thought were so important in life. When COVID took them away from us, we realized we were okay without them. And I think that a lot of people are still feeling that way. And hopefully it's changed people li people's lives for the better as far as setting priorities and understanding what they really need to make it. There seems to be this entire, this battle, the vaccinated versus the, uh, the unvaccinated and this, you know, consistent conversation in regards to that. Um, what is your take in regards to vaccines and the way things are being handled from city to city? What's your opinion in regards to that? Well, I think that the debate between getting vaccinated and not getting vaccinated is extremely absurd. It's absolutely ludicrous. It flies in the face of science. It flies in the face of public health. And it flies in the face of any kind of rational thinking of people wanting to get out of a pandemic and get out of the control of this deadly virus. Vaccines have been around for a long time. They have saved mankind over and over again. Uh, the soft vaccine saved us from polio, which was an extremely debilitating and devastating disease. And so I'm just, you know, I am, I shouldn't say I'm amused, but I'm perplexed, I guess, at how people are making all kinds of outrageous arguments against vaccinations, and they've been part of our lives for the last century or more. And so vaccines are nothing new. Uh, vaccines are well proven, they're well studied, and they have tremendous results. Uh, and so all of the, the politicking and, and all of the angling and all of the agenda generating around being vaccinated or not being vaccinated is absolutely outrageous. Um, it's cost hundreds of thousands of lives here in the U.S. alone, millions around the world. And so, you know, when I hear people um, who are, you know, you know, philosophizing and pontificating about vaccines and they have no training in science, 
They may not even take in science in college, who knows, but absolutely no training in science. And yet they're going to get up on social media and they're going to educate the rest of the country and educate doctors and researchers, by the way, who spent their entire storied careers uh, uh, looking at viruses and vaccines. It's just outrageous. And so, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, I've said on social media, the world is upside down right now on many levels, in many respects. And this whole nonsense about getting not getting vaccinated and the vaccine potentially being harmful is just, it's outrageous. How do you think we come to an end with this? Is, is there a resolution? Do you, do you foresee in your opinion, is there a solution uh, truthfully in the short term, long term? Well, you know, I like anybody else, I want a resolution. I want to return to normal as much as we can. Um, but I think what's going to happen is that, you know, unfortunately more lives are going to be lost. More people are gonna you know, dig their heels in and say they're not gonna get vaccinated, which means that the variants will continue. And eventually I think what will happen is we will reach a decent threshold of vaccination so that most of the country is protected. Uh, and therefore, and of course, with vaccines, we know, you know, no one has said that vaccines are going to stop you from getting infected. That's not what vaccines are doing. The vaccines, as far as COVID is concerned, the vaccines are stopping you in the event that you do get infected, it's stopping you from dying, it's stopping you from having a really bad course of the illness. And so people who have these breakthrough infections are having much milder courses. Some of them don't even know they've been infected because the vaccine is working. Uh, and so I think what will happen is we'll get most people vaccinated. Those who don't wanna get vaccinated will not get vaccinated. Unfortunately, many of them are going to get sick. Some of them are going to die. Um, and I think eventually over the next year or two, uh, and by the way, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm just speculating. I think over the next year or two, I think we'll be able to turn the corner. Switching gears a little bit to you. You are everyone's doctor, I feel. You're like the people's doctor, which is one of the reasons why I was so anxious to have you on the show. How does that feel for you? What does that feel like to have that, um, you know, that that prestige, that level of startup? And when did you realize that you had that, that oomph about yourself? Well, I don't... I don't know if I'm at that level of prestige. I appreciate you saying that. And I don't, you know, my high school basketball coach taught me a long time ago, never read your headlines. And so I don't read my headlines. I just do the work. Um, you know, I'm a very blessed person. Um, I was able to choose the career that I wanted. I had multiple careers. I'm an author. I'm a TV personality. I'm a physician. Uh, so I've been blessed to be able uh, to do the things that I enjoy in life, which means that I don't feel like I'm actually working. I feel like I'm having fun. I feel like I'm learning and I'm exploring this journey of life, which is amazing and I'm very present in it. Um, people hold me in high regard and I appreciate that. I think people hold me in high regard because I'm a straight shooter. Uh, I don't have an agenda. I'm very upfront, I'm very honest, I'm very transparent and above all, I try to help people. Regardless of, of, of what your political persuasion is, your race, those things don't factor in. I as a physician value life above all else and the sanctity of life. And so I try to just help people. And it brings me great joy to be able to empower others um, as they navigate what can be a very tricky course, which is what we call, call life. And so, you know, I don't know if I'm prestigious, um, but I have been fortunate enough to have very, very big platforms. Uh, people, you know, do listen to me and they like what I, I say, but I try to be honest. And I'm also very honest about not knowing things. If I don't know something I say, I don't know the answer to that, or it's not within my bailiwick of knowledge, but I'll try to find out uh, because I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. So I, I've had a great career. I enjoy it. Um, I'm not done yet. I have a lot of things I want to do in and outside of medicine. And uh, most importantly, I just try to be happy. When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? <laughs> a long, long time ago. When I was about nine years old, um, and even before that, I've always loved biology and science. I've always been a curious person. Um, and science fit me perfectly because science is about query um, and, and exploration and research and coming up with answers and then having more questions, and trying to find those answers. So science really fit me very well, the kind of person who I was and the kind of mind that I had. But I also love the ability and the power to help people um, and to be able to cure people or help them manage disease or make them understand what's afflicting them. Those kinds of things have always been interesting uh, to me, even as a young boy. 
Uh, and I remember reading when I was a kid, Ebony Magazine, uh, which was the African-American magazine at the time. I remember reading about the paucity of black neurosurgeons in the country and how important it was for us to have more African-Americans in neurosurgery and medicine in general. And that really fanned the fire that was already in me to become a physician. So one of your hats um, of you helping is not just as a doctor, but you're also an author, as you mentioned, an author of a plethora of New York Times best-selling books. Um, and you have a new book on the market right now entitled Wolf Point, which is a crime story. Tell us what we can expect within that particular book. Sure. Yeah. You know, I love crime fiction, uh, mystery, thriller, suspense, whatever you want to call it. I've always been a, a big reader of it. Uh, I also watch it endlessly on streaming uh, platforms. So I'm a big consumer of it. And so selfishly, I like to write what I like to read and, and watch. And so Wolf Point is the second installment in my Ash Kane detective series. Uh, it's based in Chicago. And in this particular case, uh, a very well-connected political figure in Chicago is found half submerged in the Chicago River at a place called Wolf Point. And Wolf Point's a real place. It's where the three branches of the Chicago River actually meet. And this gentleman uh, was found um, with the medical examiner had ruled uh, self-inflicted gunshot wounds so it was suicide. However, people didn't really believe that this particular person, as big of a life as he had, would go to this very dark, desolate place and kill himself uh, near the river. And so two years after his death, his kids go to our main character, Ash Kane, and they say to him, we know our dad wouldn't do this to himself. He wouldn't do it to us. Help us find out what happened to our father. And then the ride begins. I'm from Chicago as well. I must must tell you that. I'm born and raised. So hello there. You know, <laughs> Chicagoans, it's a difference, I must say, especially when I move away. It's, it's, we have a, it's a different vibe, a different flow, I feel like. And I'm not just saying it because I'm from there, but we, we, we move a little bit different. So I think it's amazing that you're continuing on with the sequel and continuing on with the heart of the city and carrying on that storyline within the messaging points. Um, I know that you also have nonfiction books, like a plethora of nonfiction books. Um, your lean and, and, and your your fast burn book, your clean and lean book. Uh, I can go on and on. Do you have a? Is there a certain book that you've written so far that is your? It's like your baby. When you wrote it, you just knew, okay, this is it. This is the one. This one is really <laughs> special to me. And if so, what would that one be? Well, you know, that's a difficult question to answer in the way that you posed it, because I think that most authors who have written multiple books like to believe that each book is special for different reasons. And so each book stands out to me either because of the content I cover, when I wrote it, why I wrote it, who I'm trying to reach. I mean, I have a relationship book, and even though I'm not a relationship, relationship expert, that book meant a lot to me because so many of my female friends would ask me about men and relationships. I found myself giving the same advice to them. And I, someone finally said, you just write this in a book. So the truth about men, which people don't often talk about in my repertoire is a, a, a book I think about often. Uh, but also I guess my first bestseller was a book called The Fat Smash Diet. And we don't have time to get into the story behind it, but very simply, it was a book that had gotten rejected uh, by a publisher. And I decided to self-publish the book, um, even though I didn't want to, because I felt as though I'd already been a published author from a traditional house. And I felt at the time it was beneath me as a published author to self-publish. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like, you know, so, you know, below class. Mm -hmm. But I did it at the encouragement of my brother. Uh, and that book instantly went to the New York Times bestsellers list. And for months, it was on the bestsellers list. That was my first really big hit. So that obviously has a special place to me, especially given the history that it had been rejected. But, you know, I, I write so many books because I have so much I want to talk about uh, and I don't seem like I'm going to have enough time to write all that I want to talk about. But each book helps people in a different way. You know, yes. some people like 20, they like shred, they like clean and lean. So let me just say this. No one diet works for everybody. And so the reason why I've written so many diet books is because I'm still trying to capture who it did, who the other books didn't work for. And, and, and that's an endless pursuit and I'm okay to, to be on it. Can you touch on your writing process? What is your writing process like for you? Yeah, you know, um, I, I have, I think a unique writing process in the sense that 
you know, I write my books in my head first. So I spend mm. about two months thinking about my books. I don't write anything down, but I think about my books. When you look at my novels, I think about the characters, what they look like, what how they talk, how they walk, how they move. I think about the book in terms of scenes. And what I try to do in my head is plot out, this is how I want to open the book. This is kind of the middle point of the book. And here is our climax. Um, and that's kind of how I write my novels. Um, and so once I feel like I have it pretty well situated in my head, then I sit down to the computer and go to work. And what I find is by doing that, I have never had writer's block. I don't get stumped because I, it's all in my head. It's now just a matter of me physically getting it out uh, into the computer. The nonfiction books obviously are a little different. The nonfiction books are very heavily research-based. Uh, and so I do a lot of research on my own. Um, and I read a lot about the particular topic. And then I, then I develop my take. You know, like for example, intermittent fasting, which is a big part of my book, Fast Burn. Um, so I read a lot about intermittent fasting, read, 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 read. Then I kind of think, okay, this is, this is my take on it. This is how I want to talk to people about it and how I want them to incorporate into their lives. So I'm a, I'm a big thinker first, then, then I actually do the physical writing. Oh, I love that. I love that was, that just helped me a lot. You just saying that. I love that you actually do all of this in your head before you even write everything down. What inspires you? What, what keeps you going? What keeps you ticking? What inspires me is the finality of life mm. and understanding that no matter how great someone has been, how rich, how well connected, how famous, how poor, whatever they were, it doesn't matter that we all transition uh, from, from earth, from mortal earth. Um, and even if we live to be 100, life is still too short. So one of my motivators is the idea that I have an undetermined, finite period of time to really have a great time in this place that we call Earth with people I know and don't know. And I don't want to squander that time. I want to make use of it as much as I can. And that motivates me to be positive, to be optimistic, and to be fearless. I am unafraid to try new things. I'm unafraid to fail. I'm unafraid of challenge. And that has made my life very fulfilling. Oh, I love that answer. How did the Doctors TV show come about? If you don't mind sharing that. I, I mean, I just, when I think of you, I see your face, I immediately think of that show. Um, how did that come into fruition? Uh, yeah, I'm not hosting it now, but um, I first was a co-host uh, about six, seven, seven years ago, maybe. Um, um, I had gone on the show as a guest to talk about one of my books and the executive producer uh, reached out to me a short time later and said, hey, for next season, you want to be a co-host. So I co-hosted the show for a year with four or five other doctors. Um, and then um, that was one year. And then a couple of years ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, uh, they approached me again to become the first solo host of the show. For So for uh, uh, season 14, I solo hosted the show. It's never been done before. Um, uh, and that was a very interesting experience. Um, and that's how it came about. Look at that. But you know what? It, it came to you. It came to you. You were just doing you, being yourself. And that opportunity came to you. And it's really, to me, one of your trademarks of who you are. Well, I tell people all the time that, you know, all you have to do is have a vision, put in the work and execute your plan. And others will recognize um, your value um, and your importance um, and they will come looking for you. Most of the vast majority of my opportunities and jobs have come from people coming to me saying, hey, Dr. Ian, do you want to do this? Now, that just doesn't happen overnight. You obviously have to build you know, a repertoire and a body of work that people come to know and to respect and appreciate. So hard work, as I tell my kids, hard work does pay off. You have to be patient. Uh, and you have to be uh, resilient and persistent. And so, yeah, I get a lot of offers for speaking gigs and TV shows and things like that. Uh, they come to me, but they come to me now, but there was a lot of work that went before that. What three tips, three tips you can give someone who's listening or watching, um, an aspiring writer, what would you suggest that they can do? Number one, writer's write. Writer's write, you have got to write. 
You can't make excuses that today is not a good day. Writers should write almost every day of the week, even if it's just a half a page, write something. Number two, don't over edit yourself. A lot of aspiring writers who are sitting down trying to write you know, a manuscript, they can't get it all out because they wanna write it in a perfect way. They, they write it, then they go back and edit it and they're stuck editing over and over and over again rather than getting the original thoughts out uh, on paper or into the computer. So don't edit, get it out. And once you get it out, then you have an opportunity to edit. Um, and lastly, I would say is that I think that great writers are great readers. You have to read um, whatever genre you're writing in, um, be a master in understanding and knowledge of what's out there in the marketplace, other writers, other content that's been produced. I think being a great reader lends um, itself to you being a, a great writer. Four day diet. Um, how <laughs> did that come about? And are there any tips that you can give us in particular with that particular diet? Wow, that's a classic. That's a yes, uh, that is a classic. <laughs> yeah. The, the, so the four day diet, despite the name, it's not that you're going to lose a gang of weight in four days, though you will lose some. The four day diet premise is that every four days, you change the type of way you're eating, kind of change the program. So every four days you're doing something different. Uh, and the idea behind that is a concept that I, I, felt, I felt like I, I, I experienced or discovered through my fans or followers is that people really get diet fatigue and they get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. So my idea was, okay, great. There are a lot of different ways to lose weight. There are a lot of great diets and methodologies out there Every four days, let's try something different. Um, some four, you know, so one four day segment may work well, one four day segment may not work well because that, like I said, every methodology doesn't work for everybody. And so that's the premise of the four day diet is to be able to change up every four days. And the advice I would give to people as it regards to the, to the, the overarching premise of that program is um, versatility. Uh, you know, even if you are eating healthy food, salmon and broccoli. Um, you don't wanna eat that every single day of your life. And I think that the body responds better when it is seeing a wide variety of foods in different ways. For example, you know, different types of foods at different times, using maybe intermittent fasting on top of that, all these different things I think are better for the body. So really try to change it up. Don't just stick to one plan or, or one method. Uh, have some variety. What's your day-to-day -day like? What's the day-to-day -day look like in general for you, if you could take us in your world? Well, COVID has changed my world dramatically like it's changed most of us. So I don't travel as much anywhere near as much as I used to because I do most of the things like this on Zoom. Um, but, you know, I work out very early in the morning. I love to work out. It's very important to me. I love starting my day working out. Uh, it sets me up mentally and physically. Also, from a schedule standpoint, I get it done. Uh, so, you know, if I want to do a little morning afternoon, I have a bonus workout, but I work out first thing in the morning. Um, I eat, I have family, family time. Uh, and then, you know, when everyone's off and doing their own thing, um, I do a plethora of things. I write, if I'm in a writing zone, like I'm writing a book or a screenplay or whatever, uh, then I spend several hours writing. Um, I have lunch obviously, and then I run errands. Uh, you know, I like to go out and do stuff. So, you know, I may be at Home Depot or, you know, at Target, uh, you know, doing basic things. You know, I got to do stuff like everybody else. Um, I'm very active. I like to cut my own grass, mow my own lawn. Uh, I like, I have little projects. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, I built a brand new garbage can kind of shed to hide my garbage cans uh, from the squirrels that like to actually eat the, the plastic garbage cans and get in there. And so now I I built a shed by myself. So I'm, you know, I do all kinds of things uh, and, and I have a lot of fun. No day, no two days of my life are the same. Um, and I love it that way. Uh, some of my days planned, some of it is spontane uh, a spontaneity, it's, it's spontaneous. Uh, and also I love to watch, you know, streaming services. I love to watch. I think streaming services have been, have been the greatest advanced development in the last 50 years in television because it has provided so much content uh, for all of us and has allowed people who are artists 
to be able to have a place um, to express and share their art. And so I just love streaming services. What are your spiritual practices? Do you, I don't know, are, are you spiritual? Do you meditate? Um, and, and if so, or do you, do you use a vision board? Um, what does your spiritual, what is your spiritual touch if you have one? Can you share that with the audience? I'm spiritual and I'm religious. Um, I am um, a believer um, in God. Um, and um, I believe in the universe and karma and those kinds of things. And so, you know, I've, I've traveled a lot with my family east uh, and I've learned a lot, you know, whether it's Japan or China or Indonesia. Um, but, you know, I really am a big believer that there is a bigger force. What that force may be, I don't exactly know, but I believe that there's a, a force bigger than us that is out there. And I am respectful of it. Um, and I am humble and humbled by that force. Um, and I think that 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 motivates me. I grew up in the church. Uh, my family is from the South. Uh, so I had, you know, old time religion, but, and I still believe in it, but even beyond the religion, you know, I believe, I think, I think the bigger pie is spirituality. I think religion is part of spirituality because you can be spiritual and not be religious. Um, and so, you know, I am spiritual. I, I wish I meditated more in the classic med meditative sense, but I realized that meditation just doesn't mean sitting in a room with incense burning and the lights out and yeah. you know, music on. Meditation really is about you getting um, connected um, to yourself internally in a calm way. You can meditate on a subway in New York City, which I've done. It's about getting lost in you and your own thoughts and being there and everything else kind of is kind of blotted out and blocked out. So true. Let's switch gears to the power of the circle. Um, what does your circle look like? And how important do you think it is um, for, how important is the circle to someone and, and how they maneuver in life? Yeah, you know, I think one of the sad things about life is that we're so busy and there's so much to do that you really can't form meaningful relationships with lots of people. You can form them with a, a decent amount, but not lots. When you think about how many people you'll meet over the course of your life, you know, just a small fraction of those people you'll have meaningful relationships with. So my circle is very important. I believe that people should surround themselves with people who are positive, who are outgoing, uh, who are good people. And, and I believe that the crowd you hang out with is a reflection, not just of you, but is a great influencer of, of you, what you do and how you think and how you see the world. Uh, my circle is very tight. Um, when you have a tight circle, you don't always have to speak to them either, by the way. Um, it's not yeah. like you got to be on the phone every day with them. Yeah. Um, having someone in your circle means you may not talk to them for two two or three months, but you pick up right where you left off yes. and don't skip a beat. And yeah. that's, the, right, that's the connectedness of your circle. So my circle is very important to me. Um, they are the number one priority with my family. Um, if they need something or if something's going on, I do everything I can because, like I said, you know, those are the people you have meaningful relationships with. Those are the people who, who your relationship has texture um, and understanding and meaning. And I think that it'd be nice if everyone, and everyone doesn't, unfortunately, but everyone it would be nice if they had that inner circle that was a support network, cheerleading them, helping them, advising them, um, and even actually at times, I wouldn't say reprimanding, but but getting on them um, about things that they're doing or they shouldn't be doing uh, and motivating them. Finish the sentence. I am a master of. Experience. Ooh, who can control my own. Destiny. Control my own destiny. All right, I would like to wrap up with a segment that I call Tell and Tell, which is a play on the word show and tell. What is something that you can tell the audience about yourself that um, you have not shared before, a secret, if you will? Um, I really think that I could be a tremendous actor. <laughs> uh, I know everyone says that, but I really feel like, um, I really feel like I have what it takes if I, had the time to do it to be a great actor because I think that I can 
I think that I can absorb roles. I can, I have an open mind. I'm not embarrassed. Um, I can put myself out there. And so I, one of the hidden desires, no longer hidden, I guess, is that I would love to be an actor and, um, and allow myself to be lost into characters and roles and settings um, that are not my typical. Oh, I like that. We just put that into fruition. We just, you just put that out there into the universe. So that is what's coming. That's what's upcoming next for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Your, your uh, energy is magnetic and it's just absolutely beautiful. So I appreciate you. Thank, well, thank you. you for a, thank you for a thoughtful interview, and I hope that people who are watching and listening, uh, my Instagram, I give a lot of free advice, and I'll have a lot of fun. So, go to my Instagram at Dr. Ian Smith. Spell the doctor out, I A N Smith, and pick up pick up a copy of Wolf Point. It's going to become a TV show, so it just got optioned to become a TV show. So I hope people get a chance to not just look at my diet, health, and fitness, but you know, being entertained is also important medicine too. That is awesome. Congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. well, it's a TV show. And you just threw that in there at the very end of the segment, at the end of the <laughs> well, show, as we're done. Well next, that, well, next time we talk, hopefully it'll be in production so we can talk about that. Yes, please do come back. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much. Take care. See you. Take care. All right. Well, that is it for this episode of The Journey Told Show. I'm going to leave you with words that my father would so often say to me, and that's to be the best version of you that you can be. Until next time, folks, let that sizzle in your spirit.